Greetings, I'm David Wessel, Director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. I want to welcome the online audience to our conversation today on Ukraine's economy, today's challenges, tomorrow's needs, and lessons from past reconstruction efforts. Um, I want to focus on three quick questions. One, why are we focusing on the Ukraine economy when there's so much else going on in Ukraine militarily? The answer is that we think that's where we can add some value in the conversation and elsewhere at Brookings and in other think tanks and other forums, people are talking about both the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine and the military and national security issues. Second question, and we got this already from someone online, isn't it premature to focus on organizing the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine given that the war is still going on? It's a good question. I think the answer is that we know that someday the war will end and we also know that internationally, governments and international financial institutions take a long time to get themselves organized. So it's appropriate to begin thinking about those issues today so we're prepared. And finally, some people ask, is there too much focus on Ukraine given what's going on in the world? Are we neglecting the humanitarian crisis in Haiti or the floods in the Democratic Republic of Congo or what's going on in Tunisia or the issues in Venezuela? And the answer is no, we're not ignoring those. But today we focus on Ukraine for two reasons, I think. One is we are facing public policy choices today about how to organize aid to Ukraine. And secondly, we have to be honest that Ukraine is fighting not only for its national sovereignty, but for the West in a battle with Russia, which makes it particularly a timely conversation. So we have two uh, different parts of today's program. The first part, which will begin shortly, we're gonna focus on some issues on Ukraine's economy today and governing and financing international aid. And we're gonna draw from an excellent new book from my colleagues at the Center on Economic Policy and Research in London. It's called uh, Rebuilding Ukraine Policies, uh, Principles and Policies, which is available on their website. And then secondly, uh, my colleague at the Center on Europe and the United, on the US and Europe, Constanze Seltzer-Muller, uh, who is jointly sponsoring this event, We'll moderate a panel where we're going to discuss uh, what lessons we can learn from past reconstruction efforts, the Marshall Plan, uh, uh, Iran, uh, uh, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. Uh, but she'll have more about that later. So at this point, I'd like to call first on um, Beatrice weber Damaro, who's president of the Center for Economic Policy Research, who's going to give a brief introduction. And then we're fortunate to have two of the authors of that book, Yuri Goranichenko, who's a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and Vlad Rashkovan, who's at the International Monetary Fund, whose chapter on the book focuses on one of the central questions we address today, which is how should the international community organize aid for Ukraine? So with that, uh, I turn the virtual microphone over to Beatrice. Thank you very much, David, uh, one for doing this, organizing uh, this webinar on the Ukraine and for speaking to an American audience. Uh, I, my role here is uh, to do two things. One is give some background on Europe where I am sitting and based. And second, uh, speak uh, some background on the CEPR and why we did what is the background of this particular book that you will be discussing later on. So uh, this could have been a really good year. So we have the pandemic that was finally receding and uh, we learned to live with the virus uh, to some extent and the uh, economy was picking up. Uh, in Europe, certainly everybody was feeling quite upbeat at the beginning of the year, despite the fact that there was a new wave, etc. But then, but then this huge shock, uh, the size of this shock, namely the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, uh, cannot be underestimated. It not only it demolished many of the very long held beliefs that have to do with the fact that there could be no more war in Europe and in European soul on in the Northern European plain, which has been a place where there have been many armies uh, over the last 200 years that were going in both directions between Paris and Moscow. It demolished the idea that uh, trade and, and integration, economic integration would prevent uh, uh, open hostilities and um, that the integration of global value chains would somehow you know, scramble the omelet in such a way that the costs of 
unscrambling would just be too high. Now, all of those things have been called into question. And again, you know, Europe is at the center of the storm. The Ukraine is the, in the Ukraine, there is the storm, but Europe is just next door. And in the, but the rest of the world is also uh, facing, in my view, something of a Zeitenwende, which is the word that uh, uh, the uh, German chancellor used to characterize a new era. Uh, where old beliefs, in fact, have been uh, have to be left behind, and the the new world looks much more at what some people have called the three Ds. Uh, there is going to be a much much bigger uh, role for defense. Um, there is going to be a, uh, a an increasing uh, focus on uh, reducing dependence in various directions what that means for globalization will still be have to have to be uh, clarified over time and in europe certainly there is a clear uh, view that the uh, becoming less dependent on energy from uh, russia um, will mean accelerated decarbonization now um the ukraine in the first in the first and do you do remember that uh, in the first instance there was a huge wave of uh, refugees uh, from the ukraine that were coming to europe and where uh, where I, I i would say really um embraced with with open arms but right uh, away already in march at the center of economic policy research and you should know that this is a this is a network is a network of economists over 1700 by now so it is similar to the nbr but uh, not only european but also global and at the center of economic policy research we we thought how do we how do ca how can we mobilize intellectual capacity this huge intellectual capacity which is in this network and put it somehow at the service and helping uh, within this helping with this huge crisis. And it was already then Yuri who took the lead uh, in organizing, uh, putting together a group that uh, published a first rapid response report that was about principles on how to rebuild the Ukraine. And there we were talking about a very, very early time. Uh, there was still a lot, a lot of uncertainties. And yet some of the principles and how to deliver aid are in fact still valid today. And very happy to see that uh, the G7 um, statement from this week, in fact, is taking some of them on board. Um, the Paris report, which is the name of the of the book that we are discussing today, is a much bigger um, effort. It's an almost 500 page uh, report, which covers many different sectors, many different issues. It goes about institutional building, about soft and uh, and and uh, hardware um energy um labor markets etc you will be going into diff into some detail there um let me also just state something on the on on this question of when is it is it premature uh, do we have to wait until all hostilities have stopped in order to start rebuilding and the answer is clearly no not only for the reason that you mentioned uh david uh, that there, there has to be a plan and that it has to be that it has to make sense that uh, requires already now not only thinking ahead but planning and coordinating ahead so donor coordination is absolutely essential if we want to make uh, if we want to make this aid and transfers effective but it's also important to give a direction and the direction seems to be for the Ukraine um, one that was not so clear some years ago that the direction is for the Ukraine to come into the fold of the European Union. And therefore there is a, as an as a, a, um, accession country, there is a lot of uh, anchoring, uh, commitment and anchoring, both in terms of how to rebuild, but also in how to redesign institutions that can be very helpful in this process and that already has to be deployed now. Um, last but not least, uh, it is also important to rebuild now what is being destroyed, um, critical infrastructure that is being destroyed and that which people need in order to get through the winter. There is no question of waiting until the war is over. Um, many things have to be, and, and there are areas of the Ukraine that need, need to be rebuilt now and others 
that where uh, where and and you is going to go more into that where uh, people will probably uh, move out of. And, and last but not least, one reason why we need to be thinking, not only thinking, but acting also on rebuilding the Ukraine now, is to give hope for those people who are now bravely um, in the dark and in the cold. And it's uh, it's it's winter in Europe now. Uh, winter is no longer coming. Winter is here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beatrice. And now, uh, Yuri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, see if I can share my slides. There we go. All right, so in my very brief remarks, I'll try to give you a summary of what is happening in Ukraine. Um, and so people have a sense of urgency that you know Ukraine needs a lot of help, not when the war is over, but um, now. Um, we know that you know the war in Ukraine is something Europe, as Beatrice said, have not seen um, since World War II. Right, the scale of atrocities, death, destruction, is just astonishing. Um, as I said, something we have not seen since World War II. This is a suburb of Kiev. Um, you know, lots of deaths, lots of destruction, but this is not just, you know, small suburb of a big country that was affected by the war. When you look at the map of, you know, what was once controlled by, by the Russians, so what is controlled now by the Russians, and uh, it's a huge chunk of the country, right? So this is your Kiev, this is Bucha, but there are lots and lots and lots of areas that were under Russian control or uh, still under Russian control. Now, this may seem like a small slice of the country, uh, but Ukraine is a very big country. It's the size of Texas. You know, think of Texas, California, this kind of uh, states. And so when you kind of take this area and superimpose it on other countries, this will roughly correspond to 40% of Italy, a third of Germany, and more than the whole of Hungary. And so the size of the shock, not just militarily, but also economically, is is astronomical it's a huge shock when you think about the COVID crisis when you think about the great depression the great recession you know all of these shocks are small relative to what ukraine is experiencing now you know obviously we cannot quantify all the human suffering uh, that happens in ukraine now uh, but the macroeconomic indicators are very clear there is a lot of pain and suffering right so projections for gdp uh, this year uh, anywhere between 30 and 50 percent and and I should say in current conditions it's really hard to come up with reliable macroeconomic statistics so there is a lot of uncertainty about these numbers but this is not something outlandish there is a lot of consensus out there that uh, there is a huge contraction in, in economic activity unemployment 35 percent and this is despite the fact that millions and millions of people fled the country so kind of imagine that the workforce uh, has been shrinking for quite some time and even in those conditions unemployment is very high inflation is also very high it's projected to reach 30 percent by the end of the year very high you know maybe relative to current inflation rate in other uh, developed or developing countries it's not uh, as surprising or you know astonishing as it would have been a couple of years ago but nonetheless this is a very very high number obviously it's going to be a problem for ukraine now in my uh, summary i want to focus on three immediate uh, macroeconomic challenges one is energy another one is the fiscal stance and also external imbalances so energy first and you know you can see this problem literally from space you know this is nightlight intensity ukraine is very very dark and this is not a typical ukraine ukraine is not north korea we always had lights it was as bright as you know, russia or romania or, or belarus uh what we see here today is is really unprecedented and obviously it's it's very hard to do business in these conditions when the russian missiles attack energy infrastructure of Ukraine but on the top of this uh the unpredictability unpredictability of uh, blackouts is making business you know very hard to run because you don't know if you go to a barber shop if this barber shop is going to have electricity or not so it's not just that you don't have electricity it's also that when you do not have it is very very unpredictable and you can start, you know, seeing this in various economic indicators that, you know, these blackouts are taking a toll on 
on the economy. For example, you look at registration of, of new businesses and you know they start to dip down. You look at the sales of rail tickets, uh, they start to go down, okay? Um, so this is why you know people are talking about a bigger contraction this year than they anticipated. But you know what is surprising is that despite all these blackouts, the economy is still working, right? So registration of new businesses does not go to zero; it's still there. Uh, tickets are still being sold, and railways, you know, are still being used uh, by businesses and people. So in some sense, the economy is surprisingly resilient, even in these extremely difficult conditions. Now, the second challenge is the fiscal policy. Obviously, uh, with the war, the government has very difficult time controlling spending because you know the spending is dictated by the needs of the war. And you can see that spending has increased dramatically in 2022. Well, revenues are obviously not catching up because the economy has been shrinking. And you know, as I said also, that you know it's hard to raise taxes in these conditions when the economy is is so weak and so when you look at fiscal deficits this red bars they're very very large so you kind of run a huge deficit every single month now how do you pay for this um, it's a combination of sources some of this comes from uh, extra tax revenues um, some of this is coming from external aid loans and grants from other governments and international institutions and roughly a third is coming from printing money okay now, this is not a good mix. You know, with printing so much money, you're going to obviously generate a lot of inflation. And the government has to resort to this uh, source of funding because it can't really raise taxes that much. You know, there is a limit how much you can extract from a weak economy. External aid is not exactly under their control. So that's a challenge. The only kind of remaining source here is, is printing money. And, you know, clearly this generates inflation. We see this in any kind of... Um, uh, economic indicator you know this is the time series of inflation you see it accelerating dramatically uh, now there is a little bit of stabilization at you know a little over 25 percent but as i said there is a great deal of uncertainty about these numbers and so it may well be true that we're somewhere here at 30 percent also notice that inflation expectations are really high and this may be a problem going forward okay now, what can a central bank do when you have so much fiscal dominance, right? When you're forced to print money to satisfy the war effort, to support the war effort that this country has. Uh, well, the central bank is trying to raise interest rates and also fixes the exchange rate. Uh, this uh, purple line shows the exchange rate. Um, and obviously, this provides a nominal anchor. Uh, so in, the, in a sense, this is good. But on the other hand, because with so much inflation, the currency becomes less competitive. Uh, you also have, you know, think about this as the black market. This line's here. There is a gap between the official exchange rate and this black market rate or cash rate, it's called. Um, and, you know, for example, at this point, the central bank was forced to develop because the gap was really, really large. It's still, you know, fairly significant, maybe a little bit shrinking in recent months, but still very significant. Now, this is working to some extent. Inflation is not as high as one would have anticipated, but obviously it comes at the cost that you have to burn your reserves. You know, focus on these green lines here. This is how much the central bank has to sell foreign exchange reserves to support the currency. And you know, at the peak of this uh, kind of uh, drain on the reserves, this is when the central bank was forced to uh, devalue the currency. The central bank was burning roughly $4 billion uh, per month. This is a very high rate. Uh, and just to give you a benchmark, the, at the time of the war, in the beginning of the war, the central bank had a little over $30 billion in the reserves. So obviously, this is not sustainable and something has to change. And I'll come back to this in a point uh, in a moment. Now, another fundamental problem with, uh, with the macroeconomic situation in Ukraine is this giant external imbalance. And uh, there is a physical constraint. You know, Ukraine has uh, goods that it can export to the rest of the world, but it cannot do this because many seaports, the main kind of trade routes for Ukraine are not operational. This is Mariupol. This is Berdyansk, occupied by the Russians, Mykolaiv, Kherson. Uh, this are uh, you know constantly shelled by the Russians, so you can't really use the ports either. The only big ports that are open now, this are uh, two ports nearby, but they open only for the grain deal, and so this greatly limits the ability of Ukraine to to export. 
Um, now, you can see this right away in official statistics. For example, this blue bar is so saying that exports of metals basically went to zero, to a very small number. And this was a challenge because Ukraine used to heavily rely on those exports to generate um, uh, foreign currency. Now it's not uh, possible. The other side of this coin is that because the Russians destroyed oil refineries in Ukraine, Ukraine cannot produce gasoline, fuel, or any other petroleum products. So it has to import a lot of that. And you can see that the size of these red bars increased dramatically relative to the pre-war times. Okay, so you can export and you have to import a lot. Obviously, this is going to generate a huge uh, trade deficit. Look at the size of this green bars. They are really, really large. Somebody has to pay for this. How do you pay for this? Well, fortunately, Ukraine received some aid. Um, you know, I want you to focus on this yellow bars and this gray bars. This is loans and grants from uh, other governments and international institutions. This is how you pay for this. Uh, but for example, in recent months, the amount of aid that Ukraine uh, received is much smaller. And you can see that this blue line, this is the current account balance. It's steeping into a negative territory. So it's telling you that Ukraine gets into a situation which is not sustainable, uh, not sustainable. And obviously, we don't want to have a currency crisis or anything like this in Ukraine during the war, because if something like this happens, it will be very, very hard to support the war effort in this war of attrition. Now, what is the solution to this or a solution? Uh, well, you know, with this physical constraint that the ports are not really open, you can uh, in the words of Tim Gartner, just, you know, put form on the runway. You can try to help some exports, you know, such as grain deal. You try to restrict imports. You uh, limit capital outflows. You postpone your payments on foreign debt. Maybe at some point, uh, I hope not so uh, distant future, you're going to switch to manage flow to allow market forces to do some of the correction. But in any case, it tells you that there is only so much you can do with this. Okay, this is going to be a problem for the duration of the war. Now, fundamentally, what can we do about this? Well, it's not just about military aid that Ukraine needs to defeat the Russian aggression. It's also about supporting the war effort, you know, the, 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 the economic life life on the country. And here we have, you know, two news. One is, you know, money is coming in into Ukraine. This is good. Um, and, you know, U.S. is really a leader in this. It, it issues lots and lots of grants to Ukraine. Um, this is good because Ukraine, uh, you know, a country ravaged by the war, will not be able to repay lots and lots of debts in the future. So ideally, it should be coming uh, coming in the form of grants. Um, but kind of the bad news in, in this is that when you look at the commitments versus disbursements, this you know light blue bars, dark blue bars, you see that you know many countries, especially European institutions lagging behind in terms of giving actual cash to to the ukrainian government and this was a problem because during this time of you know extreme needs in ukraine you really need hard cash you don't need promises and uh, you know this is one area where uh, international aid can be a lot more effective now to summarize you know we all think that you know, it would be great to defeat the Russian aggression uh, soon, uh, but I think realistically it's going to be a longer conflict, and so we should prepare for a war of attrition. Um, in a recent report in CPR, we discussed you know, various things the Ukrainian government and the international community can do uh, to help Ukraine. So you have to be more careful with your resources, you have to contain inflation, you have to ensure macroeconomic stability. But, you know, frankly, the most important thing uh, we can do is to give more economic and military aid to Ukraine, because this is really the best investment in peace. This is what is going to support Ukraine uh, for the duration of the war. Let me stop here. And thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Can I just ask you one question before we turn to Vlad? Could yes. you talk a little bit about the uh, resiliency of the financial sector in Ukraine? How is it doing in, amid this chaos? You know, the banking system, the financial system broadly defined, was doing surprisingly well. And in part, it's thanks to Vlad, who was um, at the National Bank of Ukraine after 2014, when lots and lots of uh, foundational reforms were done. Uh, so, for example, uh, the banking system was cleaned up. Um, the new policies were implemented. It's not one man show anymore. It's really done by lots and lots of committees. So some of the 
best institutional changes happen actually at the National Bank of Ukraine, and we see the fruits of this work. Thanks. So I want to turn to Vlad now. Vlad's an alternative executive director at the IMF, where he represents a number of countries, uh, not only Ukraine. And as uh, as Yuri said, he, among other things, he's been a deputy governor of the National Bank of Ukraine and been involved in the banking system of Ukraine. And uh, Vlad and Barry Eichen Green wrote the chapter on how to organize the, uh, the, the uh, aid to Ukraine, which is a pretty big issue. Um, people like to say that the Marshall Plan, which we'll hear about later, was uh, one donor and 17 recipients, and aid to Ukraine is 17 donors and one recipient, and it's proving pretty complicated to coordinate that. So Vlad, uh, and I know you have some slides as well, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, do you see slides? Uh? We do. You want? There we go. Yep. Yeah. You know, if I may, uh, just very briefly to leverage on what Yura said, uh, maybe two things, and I will try to build up on what uh, on his and um, Beatrice's comments. Uh, uh, Yuri said it was a surprisingly well. Uh, I would say it was not a surprise, but the result of the work uh, all all these years uh, and uh, the first weeks uh, and months. Uh, the, the National Bank followed actually the protocols which we had before in 2014, 2015, because as you know, the war started eight years ago, not now. Uh, and uh, we already experienced that, you know, the takeover of Donetsk, Lugansk, Crimea, uh, and therefore we already went for this. For sure, in the all the previous years, the National Bank was uh, trying to enhance those protocols to develop protocols and the COVID time also helped a lot uh, in order to, to show how the central bank can work uh, remotely. But uh, I think it uh, would we'll be happy to discuss this one day later, you know, because this is a, is a fascinating topic, uh, uh, you know, the financial sector during the war uh, and digitalization of Ukraine, how it helped uh, to go through this uh, uh, kind of uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, let me start, you know, you, you said about um, how to organize aid, and I fully agree with a final uh, comment of Yuri that one of the main things which the world can do is to provide funding to Ukraine, aid, both military, humanitarian, but also economic and financial aid. And I would add one small element there, not only to provide aid, but also to organize, you know, the usage of it is effective, you know, not to have a waste of the resources on the way of the um, of those reforms. And let's speak about how much money we need. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a very difficult question, and Yuri mentioned about that, that uh, I think it's yet prematurely to say. We can say maybe for some period of time or end of, uh, you know, June or September, you know, there are different figures, and the war is not con didn't finish yet. Therefore, clearly, these figures will, you know, more or less uh, uh, go, for, I mean, will, will be further clarified. Uh, but we have, uh, uh, we need to distinguish between, like, this World Bank uh, methodology, we need to distinguish the, the damages. Uh, you know, and the damages is, uh, for example, Kiev School of Economics and uh, uh, um, World Bank, uh, they did a damage assessment. Uh, the recent uh, report from the Kiev School of Economics saying that as of today, or as of end of September, somehow, the uh, around $130 billion already of the direct infrastructural damages. Uh, and as Yuri mentioned, uh, we cannot count, uh, you know, the humanitarian uh, losses uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 the pain uh, uh, for people. Uh, but um, at least uh, it is assumed now that uh, until the war end, uh, the damages could, could reach, uh, you know, even 500, 500 600 billion dollars. Uh, uh, and uh, we see, uh, we will see the next assessment uh, from the World Bank. Uh, they are going to do it uh, as of end of this year. Therefore, we will probably see in somewhere in February, March, uh, uh, more detailed report uh, from the from the World Bank itself. The second thing is about economic losses. Uh, uh, Yuri mentioned about 30, 50 percent uh, uh, decline of the GDP um, uh, this year only, uh, which means, uh, you know, the, the current estimation of the IMF is around 55 percent. Uh, probably the recent uh, military attacks, missile attacks uh, can worsen this, this figure by end of the year, but uh, which means that it's uh, like a swapping out the 70 billion dollars of the uh, of the Ukrainian GDP, but if you speak about the, you know, the potential uh, loss, uh, you know, for the next years, uh, the the, dam the the damage, uh, the losses for Ukraine are, are substantial, as you see. Uh, and later you speak about recovery needs or reconstruction needs, uh, and here you come with an even different figures because uh, 
The World Bank assessed uh, that the next, like immediate, next 18, 36 months uh, needs uh, for the reconstruction using the, one of the principles, uh, uh, building back better, you know, would be around $100 billion. Uh, and uh, uh, for five years, around $350 billion, while uh, the assessments from uh, uh, the um, uh, from the Ukrainian government, uh, which they showed in Lugana conference, was around seven hundred fifty billion dollars. Uh, and later, you have another assessment coming from uh, European Investment Bank that uh, investment needs for Ukraine and also to also to not only to recover but also to catch up with uh, other um, uh, other peers uh, m- m- could could even uh, be higher than one trillion dollars. Uh, we put some comments in our chapter. I will not, you know, uh, repeat the chapter. I really encourage you to read the the, the book uh, and uh, our chapter number fifteen, uh, how to organize aid. Um, uh, but uh, using some, uh, you know, methodology and leveraging also on the previous CPR job, which also Yuri did, uh, we may say that uh, the range uh, of the financial needs could be substantial. You know, from you know five hundred to uh, one trillion dollars. Uh, in the you know next 10 15 years and uh, you know to get there you know to this money you know there are many difficult uh, obstacles on the way or you know the barriers or so i name them crossroads which we need to go through and this is uh, uh, how these uh, cross uh, how the the path through these crossroads will be incorporated to the um, you know to the um, uh, design of the architecture for reconstruction is very much important uh, because one of the major principles um, which we put in the in the paper and uh, I fully agree with uh, others who say it uh, that Ukraine should own the reconstruction because Ukraine should bring their vision for reconstruction but at the same time there should be also the cooperation with others with European Union as a strong anchor for the uh, for the for the future of Ukraine but also other other partners uh, there is not we don't need to be afraid of these kind of concept of the external governance, uh, which sometimes is uh, uh, Ukraine is threatened by. We need to have an ownership, but we are the country which wants to cooperate with other countries. Uh. Second thing is, uh, and this is what Beatrice said, uh, we clearly go now through winterization and there is a lot of needs uh, to help the, the, the households, uh, you know, to fix the windows, to fix the roofs, uh, because uh, clearly if you don't do it now, you know, go, the, the house is going through the winter, they will require much more investments uh, next year. Therefore, we need to protect those houses. Uh, but at the same time, uh, or we need uh, mobile houses, then uh, the temporary housing for people. But at the same time, there is a risk uh, that if you focus on that only, uh, you know, you will lose the, the longer term perspective because uh, the reconstruction is clearly uh, an opportunity also, you know, to get rid of the Soviet legacy or post-Soviet legacy, also of architecture, of urban planning, etc., and really try to build back better. But uh, it will require more money, more time, more thoughts. Uh, and that's why I fully agree with Beatrice that it's better to start thinking now and not later. We also have some issues with uh, coordination, as uh, and we will go a little bit in a second. Uh, Beatrice said about uh, G7 recent, uh, you know, announcement about the coordination platform. But we should be very frank. You know, there is some kind of slow. I mean, I would say rivalry or competition or who has a flag. Uh, of which country for the reconstruction uh, you see you know the conference in Lugano and later you have a uh, in Berlin later you have a um, uh, in Paris uh, I hope they bring uh, some added value every time when you go from one conference to another it's not an only event management uh, you know but uh, uh, I say again we need to have a more cooperation and coordination instead of the rivalry and this is important for for Ukraine there is no time for rivalry and who is a bigger boss uh, in this post reconstruction world uh, uh, we need to understand that for Ukraine there is only one government uh, and the, when the all, when this government should work actually with all the institutions in the world uh, it's really time consuming and, and the transaction costs are, are very high for that you know uh, loans uh, or grants uh, we put as a principle grants uh, for sure, but also not only public money, but private investments should go, uh, uh, you know, to reconstruct Ukraine. We do hope that the reparations uh, or the Russian assets which are frozen will be used also for the reconstruction, but it will require time. And uh, while we are focusing on to get these grants, uh, we also need to understand that uh, time, uh, and this is what uh, Yuri said uh, uh, in his uh, in his presentation, you know, unfortunately, you need to have loans as well. You need to have them now because you need to finance the economy as it's running. And not every country has a 
uh, had a um, you know the the potential uh, in their budget uh, to provide grants uh, to Ukraine. I will not mention other things, but we need to uh, just to leverage what uh, David you said and what uh, Beatrice said. Why we need to think also now because uh, after the war, you know, I personally don't want Ukraine to get uh, from the war, you know, with a more stronger state economy or strong the hand versus the. Uh, you know, democracy and freedom and liberal economy, because as we know, there is a, a lot of uh, um, possibilities, you know, let's use this word, uh, of the of the negative outcome of the war. And we need also to think about that, how to over, uh, how to avoid the, the negative outcomes. Huh? Um, this is a chart, this is a slide which is not in our um, uh, chapter, but uh, um, I put it, uh, uh, I developed this kind of frame uh, back in March, uh, April, and I remember when we had a first call with Yuri uh, that time, I think with Kenneth Rogoff, uh, and we discussed, uh, you know, what, uh, what could be the uh, recovery architecture framework. Uh, and if you look at this, so clearly we need to speak about the prerequisites, principles, uh, you know, the vision and, the, you know, the recovery plan. We need to understand how the uh, reconstruction is uh, framed or connected to the European Union accession process. But all of this is, this is what uh, Beatrice is thinking, you know. And uh, you see that uh, our book uh, currently is actually answering all, most of these questions because the recovery plan and vision is coming in the chapters number 213. Uh, Yuri and Ilona in the, in the introduction part, they wrote, write a lot about the principles and the prerequisites. Uh, and we are covering on a, on a, on a big block, uh, which is uh, actually not only thinking, but what we need to be acting, as Beatrice said. Uh, and acting is uh, we need to find the, the funding for the reconstruction. We need to develop the implementation engine for the reconstruction. We need to build this coordination platform, which is a uh, or coordination uh, you know mechanism for for the donors and partners. But also we need to build a bridge between money and implementation in order, as I said, to avoid that the um, the money will be wasted uh, in the uh, in the reconstruction. And the Yuri mentioned very well. He showed the slide. Uh, about the commitments versus uh, the disbursements. Uh, and I, I should be very frank, uh, you know, the needs, uh, as I read in one book, you know, the needs, uh, request of money, the pledges and disbursements and commitments uh, or commitments and disbursements are completely different figures. And uh, hopefully at least they overlap. You know, just give you an example. In, in March, there was a conference, pledging conference for Ukraine uh, in Warsaw. And they said that they collected 6 billion euro for Ukraine Ukraine got zero from this, zero, really nothing. And later from another conference, which was assume, uh, announced 9 billion, Ukraine received six or seven, six months later, 500 million euro. Just to give an idea about the, how the, you know, the pledges are different from disbursements. I'm not sure you have seen this table because in our chapter, we have a, uh, the, the, the chart, which uh, Yuri showed in his presentation. This is a table as of December 14 uh, on the all, uh, yeah, money which we say Ukraine received. Uh, and you may recall that in, in April during the annual meetings, uh, during spring meetings, the Kristalina Georgieva actually certified uh, that Ukraine needs about $5 billion per month in 2022. And as you see that the total number of the figures with all the efforts which we paid, which were played this year, you see no single month uh, Ukraine managed to receive $5 billion. And this is the problem. And, and also you see the rhythm. Uh, rhythm is completely different. It's not rhythmic. And this is what Yuri said when he was speaking about the senior rush and, the, and monetary financing, which clearly is not a, the best outcome. But this monetary financing was a result of not a rhythmic and timely, you know, the international aid with all the attention for Ukraine in 2022. I, I feel that 2023 might be even more difficult with the developments in, in US politics, uh, uh, with uh, European Union going through the winter, you know, and uh, this we might be a, a complicated year, and that's why we need to put a lot of efforts. And as uh, Beatrice said, and uh, David, as you asked, we need to really focus on that now. Having said that, are there money available today? No, there are no yet available money for the reconstruction, but there are many potential resources for the for the uh, for money. They may come, you know, from from IMF. You know, IMF is helping. We have have a board meeting uh, next Monday for the monitoring program, which hopefully will lead to the early next year to more cash program for Ukraine. I'm provided around uh, $2.7 billion this year to help Ukraine to run uh, the economy. There are bilateral loans and grants, which Yura was saying, 
you know, there is a multi-donor fund from the World Bank, which is using very, is working very well, you know, and I think it might become a, a very good instrument as a multi-donor fund in future. And we write about that in our in our chapter. The SDR channeling, so the money which has a, like the IMF currency, unfortunately, we didn't manage this year, but we still don't close this, this possibility for future. You know, World Bank is doing a lot of job. MIGA is just uh, now working on the war insurance, which is, will be very much important for the for the development of the private investments for Ukraine uh, during the uh, next uh, next year, different multi multinational development banks like EIB, BRD, IFC, including JICA, you know, they 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 will clearly will be ready to come. Maybe mostly to the private sector, they already support Ukraine, European Union. You mentioned European Union, you know, which is a little bit going behind the US and providing money. And unfortunately, they don't have grants; they provide the loans only. Uh, but they are currently in the discussion of 18 billion euro of the next for the next year in the parliament approved now it's the is the topic you know how to implement it next year uh and uh probably we will we will see more pre accession and structural funds uh, for the for the reconstruction it's not yet clear and maybe one day that we we can think about something like a, a european union bond similar to new generation eu also to finance ukraine i mean i don't know if uh, we will manage the uh, to have a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. Huh? But I strongly believe that the reconstruction may be a good opportunity for the Marshall Plan for Europe. You know, because uh, Marshall, if you add together, you know, the, these uh, new generation EU together with free season initiative and the reconstruction of, of Ukraine, this will be a good opportunity for EU also to review, I mean, a little bit to rethink also themselves uh, uh, in, a long, in a longer term. Russian assets could be also an, an, an instrument and in reparations or different type, type of the taxes uh, from the Russian export. Unfortunately, we are not there yet on that. Uh, on that, and also private capital and internal uh, uh, internal resources they can be also used for that. But the question is not the system is not so linear. You need, really need to balance, you know, to 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 manage, you know, to uh, to model on a daily basis which kind of instruments, which kind of countries, you know, which institutions, how, in which, uh, when, uh, who is given that, and that's why we so much need the the, the coordination platform. I'm happy to say that I was the, you know, one of the initiator of this uh, economic Rammstein concept, which I, which we agreed with the president, prime minister, and later we, uh, as a proposal from the government, uh, uh, provided to G7 countries. Uh, I'm happy that last uh, Monday, uh, the um, uh, this Monday, you know, on the 12th, uh, the, uh, the G7 leaders came with uh, their communique, which actually saying that yes, we create this platform. Yes, there will be, uh, you know, the financial track, which is will focus on the on the short term needs. There will be also the larger, you know, needs understanding how to support Ukraine. There will be secretariat for that, uh, which is already a big step. Even G7 doesn't have a secretariat, you know. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, and the operational platform of these. Uh, 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 operational layer of this platform is already working. With, they're meeting by weekly, and we're going to develop them uh, uh, further. Um, uh, and uh, Ukraine is, a, is an important element, uh, an important partner in this, uh, and also leading these uh, efforts now, which shows, again, the, one of the principles for the um, uh, Ukrainian ownership. One of the questions, you know, we'll, we'll discuss the, the next Marshall Plan, uh, who is the next Mr. or Ms. Marshall, you know, because still we are missing, you know, someone who will take a uh, leadership uh, in the world. And again, I don't have an answer who can be just a number of uh, pictures, which I have in mind, but uh, we don't have yet that leader globally. So Vlad, go back to that picture and tell people who they are. Not everybody will know those faces. No, we, why? You know, these are you, uh, sorry, you have uh, Ursula von der Leyen, you know, the president of the European Commission. You have the Samantha Power, the, the head of... Uh, um, you say D, you have Boris Johnson, you have Draghi, you know, you have Dombrovskis, you know, the, who's working, who's one of the biggest supporters of Ukraine. You have David Lipton, who was working in IMF and uh, recently in Treasury. And you have a general, you know, who's working, Petras, who's working very closely and uh, monitoring what is going on in Ukraine. I would not, I mean, is, is Ukraine, Ukraine is not a military, uh, uh, you know, economy, hopefully after the war. But, you know, maybe there are other names. Uh, but so far, you know, with all this discussion, there is no one leader, no marshal. I don't know if we need a marshal, but it's a, it's a good question. Uh, who can be that? Maybe it could be institution, maybe. But still, someone should have a, you know, um, who can, who in 50 years or 70 years, we can mention as a person for, you know, helping Ukraine most. 
And finally, you know, um, to go to the implementation, uh, I mean, we need uh, uh, to, um, to build the implementation engine for that. And there are many options. There are many different countries. We analyzed many different uh, examples. You know, clearly you can create a separate like a agency, government, non-government agency. You can integrate the agency to the uh, to the existing ministerial system, meaning that uh, there could be a minister, vice prime minister responsible for reconstruction. Uh, you can have a decentralized system on the regional levels, like a heads of reconstruction in different regions. You can have an international agency, uh, uh, or you have some kind of hybrid models. Uh, we had a debate even within uh, between with Bari, even with Yura, you know, with others, we had a debate. Uh, we strongly believe that we need to merge somehow the idea of, uh, you know, European vector, European integration and Ukrainian ownership. So we believe, uh, and at the same time, the coordination, so the three different uh, vectors. Uh, so we believe that uh, uh, the majority of people should be sitting in Kiev. Uh, the largest agency could be, I don't say, EU-led, EU agency, but clearly there should be also in management, uh, uh, in the supervisory board should be uh, people I mean, representing the G7 countries and uh, non-European G7 countries just to not to uh, pretend that it's only European uh, project. Uh, and later, you know, how to um, uh, operationalize this. Uh, we wrote also about this in, in our chapter, uh, but uh, I mean, I think this is uh, one of the topics also for the coordination platform to put this in place. This is not the end because uh, as soon as you have an agency, as soon as you will have a multi-donor fund, uh, you know, to manage Ukraine, as soon as you will have, uh, you know, the coordination platform, you really need to build a bridge between them and uh, how to go from needs assessment, you know, to the, to the all the, you know, strategizing uh, programming of the pro of the of the reconstruction project verification. You know, the mid term, short term to mid term, long term budgeting and planning, uh, uh, finding resources for specific projects, uh, doing the pro public procurement. You know, uh, you know, building itself. You know, not, not only building because it will require also a lot of soft uh, things, uh, not only the infrastructural things, uh, and there will be a lot of the, about social mobility, about reconciliation, uh, you know, people. So we need to go through this. Uh, and uh, clearly, you need to have just pure things like accounting, controlling, reporting, because uh, the figures which I showed to you about the, the support for Ukraine, this is only support of Ukrainian budget, uh, which doesn't include the the support of the state-owned enterprise does not include the support of the private business. Doesn't include support of the uh, of the um, uh, regional levels or, or in-kind contribution from like a uh, hug to Kiev or from Denmark to Mykolaiv. Uh, you know these the figures don't include. So we really need to have a proper financial you know digital system which would track uh, those resources uh, uh, like it's done it was done in Pakistan or Indonesia and. Uh, we need also to build a lot of analytics, you know, to give uh, the opportunity for civil society to oversight uh, the process of, uh, of, of monitoring. This is also a part of Ukrainian ownership, but also you need to evaluate later, like, finally, did you manage to build back better? So all of this is not existing now, and it does not exist. There are some different groups that are working on this, like we speak, uh, and uh, without that, without, the, you know, the understanding of the funding, understanding the, the implementation agency, without the, this building an accountability framework and without, uh, you know, donor coordination, the reconstruction will be a failure. And we don't need a failure, we need a success. And we want to others to be a part of our victory and also victory, not only in the war, but also in the peace. Uh, and therefore I encourage all the bright minds and thanks David for organizing this event uh, to think about that in advance is not, prematurely, this is the exact time what we need to do it, and also to encourage Ukrainians to fight more uh, in order to, you know, to, 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 to demonstrate them that the world will support them, and they know how to do it and will be ready as soon as Ukraine wins the war. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Let me ask you a couple of questions, and I have a couple for Yuri as well. So um, <clears throat> exactly what is this new G7 arrangement going to look like? So each G7 country, uh, which uh, is, includes the U.S., of course, and Japan, will have a representative on some kind of oversight board. And then there's going to be a secretariat. What, what do we know about that secretariat? What kind of people? Where is it going to sit? Who's going to pay for it? Do we know anything about that? Yeah, the, uh, you're, you're asking the right question, but I would, if I may, a little bit extend it, okay? Sure. So uh, the, uh, our idea was uh, that actually there are three different layers. 
One is already existing, which is a G7 ambassador on the ground. They are already coordinated together with a representative of international institutions. But they are collecting on the ground the information, their interlocker, in, you know, how's it, the liaison so with the uh, Ukrainian government. They collect all the needs uh, and they distribute later them to, to the, share them with their capitals. Um, well, second thing is we're thinking we need to have more operational and financial side, uh, you know, and this is a uh, this has been created in March uh, between uh, the IFIs, uh, so meaning that uh, international financial institutions like uh, IMF, World Bank, EBRD, EIB, and European Commission. They had uh, biweekly meetings uh, on the coordination of the of the aid, uh, mostly for information sharing. What we did now after Berlin conference in October, we also invited the Ukraine. We also Ukrainian representative from Ministry of Finance. We invited the U.S. as the biggest, uh, you know, the supporter of Ukraine, and we also invited Germany as a G7 president. And next year, this should be uh, um, the um, yeah, Japan. You know, shall we enlarge this group to other G7 countries or allow Japan, you know, to represent G7? This still will be, will be discussed. But the idea is that while it was a meet, it was a platform for coordination of information flow, we need also to go a little bit further and to disburse, to, to repurpose it. Uh, factually, the team uh, of these uh, information, uh, like a, of this layer should start with the table, which I showed you, you know, and thinking about three, six months in advance, uh, you know, where we will have a uh, gaps uh, in financing. And factually, they need to bring these, uh, like I'm a part of the, this team, you know, with a prime minister, but I want someone in the world, this group, uh, to bring them, bring these tables to their capitals. And actually, this is the political level. And the political level, the idea is should be represented by the, um, our proposal was the G7 ministers, uh, um, the, um, uh, in the G7 leaders, uh, communicate, they don't specify as a minister, they, they specify ministers in another place. Uh, uh, and uh, the that ministers should meet uh, in January. Uh, but uh, the it could be ministers or it could be, and from Ukraine to be a prime minister, and uh, it could be also the, the Sherpas, you know, from uh, uh, from G7, which is also be a high level. Uh, but, uh, and later you need to have someone who would coordinate or even this coordination. And this is secretariat. You know, someone who would prepare the meeting, someone who will prepare the, um, uh, you know, the minutes, who will follow between the meetings, you know, what is going on and what is done. And uh, as of now, uh, the, the Ukrainian proposal is that this should be in Kiev. The secretariat should be in Kiev. There is a reform delivery office working with uh, um, uh, with the prime minister. It's financed by European Commission, financed by EBRD. They are capable people. They are ready to do it. Uh, we want to leverage on that. Uh, European Union, European Commission believes it should be placed in the European Commission. Uh, and I think this is a, the discussion about secretariat uh, is still ongoing. Uh, but uh, for me, the secretariat is a secretariat. Okay. The important things are going between the political level and informational level. Why secretariat is not, it should not be so powerful, you know, so I would say like this. I see. Yuri, a couple of questions have come in about um, the economics of aiding Ukraine. Uh, one of them, which I know you've heard before, is how can donors be sure that Ukraine is solving the problem of corruption that has so often plagued this country? And where is that? And I'll tell you what the second one is. Well, is can Ukraine's economy prosper if the refugees uh, become permanent exiles or do they need people to come back? Right, so corruption is always coming up in these conversations. Yeah. And <clears throat> unfortunately, Ukraine has a reputation and it takes time to to change this reputation. <laughs> and uh, I must say, you know, it's true that Ukraine has problems with corruption, but we should put this in the perspective. We, we go back to 2014, the revolution of dignity. This was truly the lowest point in, in history for Ukraine. You know, Yanukovych, the president at the time, was literally looting the country and uh, since then we had lots and lots and lots of reforms so, you know the national bank of ukraine reform is a part of this effort to really reinvent the country we have a new anti-corruption uh, uh persecution office we have a new office to prevent corruption um so lots of things were done even before the war uh now with the eu on the horizon there is a strong demand in Ukraine to push through this very difficult reforms 
and also a lot of demand from the EU side to kind of accelerate this process. And for example, um, when Ukraine got their candidacy status, uh, we had some issues with appointing a new anti-corruption uh, prosecutor. You know, so by some miracle, you know, it became possible, and he was appointed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so lots of things are changing, and this is why, you know, one of the things we emphasize in our report is that you have to have some type of conditionality. There has to be some way to verify that money is well spent. Uh, and Ukraine has already some infrastructure to do this. So I think this is happening. And, uh, uh, you know, in some ways for Ukraine, there, at least in Ukraine, there is a clear appreciation that corruption is an existential threat. It's not just Russian missiles. We have to deal with corruption if we want to be a successful country. Now, about the refugees, it's true that many people love the country, but all sorts of polls done on these people suggest that the vast majority of them want to return to Ukraine as soon as the hostilities end. Right. So 90 percent, 80 percent, some of them are going to uh, stay, obviously. But in a way, this is a resource, because if we want to integrate Ukraine into the European economy, we have to have those bridges, you know, some contacts on the ground that are going to uh, help to establish economic links, you know, bridges, if you will. And so this is a good resource. Also, some people are now working remotely and again this is an opportunity to kind of expand the labor force beyond the border so even if people are not on the ground they are still useful members of the society great so i want to thank you both for a uh, really a uh, good uh, taste of what's in the cepr report i want to encourage people to look at it it's uh it's very detailed um and i think a lot of thought went into it which i think has laid a great foundation for the kind of choices that both Ukraine and the donors are going to have to make in the years ahead. Um, and I think we all uh, want to uh, hope and pray that we are soon, as soon as possible, in, uh, have at least a tentative peace in Ukraine so we can focus exclusively on uh, economic issues as opposed to protecting the people of Kyiv from Russian missiles. But I think we have to be realistic that this is uh, not going to happen anytime soon or in for a long haul. Um, I want to turn the podium over now to my colleague, Constanze Stelzemuller. Uh, one of the ways when we conceived this event, it just struck me that I heard so many references to the Marshall Plan, some from people who probably couldn't tell you what the Marshall Plan was, um, that it would be good to take advantage of the expertise that we've been able to recruit to say when the world has tried to help. Uh, countries recover from situations, uh, some as bad as Ukraine, some worse, uh, some not so bad. What did we do right and wrong there so we can employ those lessons and at least make new mistakes the, new, the next time around? Um, so we have four uh, panelists, and I'm going to let Constanza introduce them. So Constanza, your turn. You're on mute, Constanza. Hello. Uh, you know, three years of pandemic and still you make these mistakes. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, David um, and uh, Yuri Gorodnichenko and Vladislav Rashkova and Beatrice Beda de Mara for a brilliant panel that really set out a staggering challenge. My name is Constanze Stetzenmüller. I run the Center on the United States and Euro at Europe in the Foreign Policy Division at Brookings. And I'm really grateful that uh, David reached out uh, to us for us to do this event together. I would also only just say about the Marshall Plan that um, it is part of Brookings history that the economists um, at, uh, of Brookings in the, in the 1940s contributed quite significantly to the, the numbers that uh, the economic analysis that was um, used by the um, Truman government for the Marshall Plan. So that is one of our claims to fame, before my time, obviously. Um, but with that, I'm going to um, hand over to our second panel, the lessons of the past. And we will be looking at the Marshall Plan with Harold James presenting, South Sudan, Brian De Silva, Afghanistan, our colleague Nahid Sarabi presenting, and finally, Iraq, um, Hideki Matsunaga from Japan. Um, Professor James, who will go first, is a distinguished economic historian at Princeton University uh, with a, a specialization on German economic history in the interwar period and the post-war period, 
and uh, also an ex expert on the history of globalization. So he is literally the, uh, the best scholar we, we, we could have possibly have found to speak to us about the lessons from the Marshall Plan. Over to you, Harold James. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you, Constance, uh, um, and thank you, David. It's it's great to be here on this very important panel, and uh, also to congratulate CEPR uh, on their uh, really wonderful, Im important uh, book. Um, I'm going to try to uh, share some slides. Uh, let me see whether I can do that. Um, uh, it's uh, it, it seems to have gone away though. Um, let me try again. Um, no, I, I just can't find it, unfortunately. Uh, so oh, you uh, got, we got it. It's up. We see it. It's 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 up. Okay, wonderful. Uh, that's great. Um, and uh, we do this. Um, perfect, perfect. So, uh, yes, it's absolutely right. Uh, and thank you, David and uh, Constanza, to go back to the story of the Marshall Plan. Um, the Marshall Plan uh, was transformative, but because it was so transformative, it's produced always historical echoes. Whenever there's an event, for instance, the uh, collapse of the planned uh, socialist economies in the uh, 1989, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Uh, people always think you need a Marshall Plan, the Arab Spring, the European debt crisis, you need a Marshall Plan. And so it accumulates a lot of myths around it. Uh, but first of all, I just wanted to introduce very briefly uh, what's in the Marshall Plan and what's in the speech that uh, Secretary of State uh, Marshall made at the Harvard commencement in uh, June of 1947. Um, and it looks in some ways astonishingly actual, astonishingly relevant. Um, the modern system of the division of labor upon which the exchange of products is based is in danger of breaking down. Uh, Europe's requirements for the next three or four years of foreign food, other essential products, are so much greater than her present ability to pay. Um, the needs to break a vicious circle, restore the confidence of the European people in the economic future of their countries and of Europe as a whole. And uh, then saying that this is the business of the Europeans. The initiative, I think, must come from Europe. Those are all the words of uh, George Marshall. And they, they look as if they really could have been made uh, by somebody speaking about today's problems. Um, Marshall asked the right questions. Um, and you've been looking at those questions in the previous panel. How the amount of aid given relates to the scale of the intended effects, how aid can be used as a catalyst for a general development of productive forces, how support can bind the recipient into a deep network of international uh, connections. And Yuri was just saying exactly how the massive migration, uh, the people fleeing from the horror of the Ukraine war has the capacity to create a network in, in Europe and, uh, and elsewhere. How much should be organized by the governments and how knowledge in the private sector of the donor can be used to transform productivity in the recipient. So uh, Ukraine lagged very badly since 1990 in comparison, say, to Poland or to the Russian Federation, uh, you need to get a better kind of economic development in the future to sustain the viability of Ukraine as a political system. But the Marshall Plan also produced its problems. Um, and I think there are two myths. Uh, one of them is a positive myth, and the other a negative myth. The positive myth is that this was a uniquely generous act, uh, that it's something that can't ever be repeated again in terms of its 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 scale, uh, that the American people, uh, even after the strain of fighting the Second World War, were just prepared to give away money. Um, the negative version of it is that uh, this was 
purely oriented to American political calculations, American domestic political calculations, and of a way of imposing an American view on the rest of the world, that it was a tool of US imperialism. And you will hear both of those stories told about the Marshall Plan. And in particular, the second one, uh, that, that this is a tool of US imperialism, I think uh, comes about because this was born at the beginning of the Cold War. And so it looks like a Cold War instrument. Uh, and it's after the civil war in Greece, the civil war in Turkey in, in the summer of 1947. But to start with that, it's not quite right to say that. I mean, this is a very parochial Princeton point, uh, but the outlines were already announced before the civil war in Greece, uh, before the civil war in Turkey, before the Cold War really started in February 1947 uh, in Marshall's very, very first speech as Secretary of State uh, to a group of alumni in Princeton University. Um, then the question about the generosity of it. Uh, so it's massively front loaded um, and it's massively concentrated on Western Europe. Um, so you can see the scale of it going over time, uh, going downwards. Um, when you think of the Marshall Plan, I think in the memory of it, uh, it's often thought of as something that contributed particularly to the rehabilitation of Germany. And it's striking uh, that we have, and uh, it's, it's a very generous source of, of funding, the German Marshall Fund, which is Germany's way of repaying uh, the amount of support that Germany got. Uh, but Germany is only a very small portion uh, of this uh, this aid, 11% overall. Um, and in terms of the contribution to uh, national income, you can say uh, Germany is way down on there. It's only 3% of German national income. Uh, that is involved in the support. Uh, some countries, Austria, the Netherlands, have a much greater degree of support, Ireland uh, or France even, um, but uh, Germany is relatively little. Um, can we talk about the amounts? Uh, the total amount at the time uh, was 13.3 billion. If you want to scale that up to today's value, it's 175 billion. Um, you might want to measure it as a share of GDP at the time, in which case you get a higher level, and then you're getting close to these one trillion figures that uh, uh, Vlad was uh, referring to. Um, and you have to think of that, obviously, in terms of the relationship to the amount of damage that has been done to Ukraine uh, and the amount that's needed uh, for rehabilitation. What the Marshall Plan specifically did, and why it is actually only such a small proportion of national income in the 1940s, is that it's required to finance particular imports. Uh, it's concentrated in just two areas, foodstuffs, because the Europeans at that time couldn't feed themselves. And if they couldn't feed themselves, they couldn't work, so they couldn't restore the economy. And secondly, machine tools, because the uh, Europe was devastated by the physical consequences of the war, you needed to get new equipment. There were three large machine tool producers in the middle of the 20th century, but two of them, Japan and Germany, had been destroyed by the war. And so it's only the United States, the third, that came into question as a possible supplier of machine uh, tools. Um, so uh, one of the critical and interesting features of the Marshall Plan is the way in which the aid from abroad is also linked to governments on the spot doing their own investment programs, because importers, instead of paying the exporter in the United States, would pay the government, and the government would, in consequence, develop counterpart funds, which it could use in terms of a national economic plan. And they did that in order to build up, again, key sectors, particularly electricity uh, production. Um, it's catalytic um, in that this is a story where the projects that are advanced have a much greater effect because there's a lot of private money coming in as well. And finally, the Marshall Plan is also linked, and this is why people remember it in 
in, in, in Germany as well, uh, to a solution of the debt issues, the outstanding debt issues uh, that existed uh, before the announcement of the Marshall Plan. Um, it's very, very complicated in terms of the number of people, institutions that are involved in doing it. And so in that sense, it's like the complexity uh, that Vlad was talking about in, in panel number one. But there is an administrator of the Marshall Plan, and I think that's what really you're looking for rather than the person who announces it. Uh, so the equivalent of Paul Hoffman, who was the person who really put this all together, an American uh, civil servant. Um, but he had wide representation in his committees from the business, labor, agricultural interests of the United States. And then it's coordinated through a newly created organization, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation. That's the uh, origin of the OECD. Um, and uh, then there's a payment system that's multilateralized through the Basel Bank for International Settlements, not through the International Monetary Fund. Um, let me come to some lessons from this uh, very, very briefly. Um, a large amount of money is required for reconstruction, but the US wasn't the source of the major funding uh, for the reconstruction after the Second World War. And the same principle, I think, should apply to Western governments funding Ukrainian reconstruction. What they can do is to trigger specific bits of reconstruction. And the key to doing that is to identify the bottlenecks. Uh, you know, clearly there are energy uh, sector issues uh, because, in particular, the way that the war has been transformed since November has turned to a Russian attack on energy infrastructure as well as uh, hospitals uh, in Ukraine. Those need to be reconstructed, uh, put in place very, very quickly again. But you might also think in the longer term, uh, what kinds of bottlenecks do we have? Um, in high-tech sectors, uh, you can think of the way in which high-tech investment, and the, one of the things that the war demonstrated was U Ukraine's superb capacity in terms of software capability. Um, you can think of building a software economy uh, that is going to be a very, very dynamic economy in a broader frame of reconstruction. So it's not just repairing the physical damage, but it's thinking of investments that can make for a really dynamic economy. Uh, debt relief, um, it's going to play a really major question, as it did for uh, the European economies in the 1940s. Um, at the end of 2021, before the 24th of February, in the new phase of the war, uh, Ukraine's external public debt was around 57 billion, over a quarter of GDP, including quite a large amount owned to the IMF. Um, and there's also a large private sector debt. But then the gross debt position corresponds to substantial, mostly privately held assets abroad, so that the net international investment position is much, much smaller. And it's a question also, I think, of mobilizing those substantial assets held abroad in terms of getting the reconstruction uh, going. Um, the employment of some part of the funding of reconstruction at the discretion of the recipient government in the style of those Marshall counterpart funds is a key part of the process of creating ownership and building democracy. And that's really vital to the desired process of restoring normality. The question that was raised uh, to, to David, uh, Western funders should be concerned about the potential for corruption. But too intrusive a monitoring by outsiders and outside institutions, as opposed to democratic and transparent control in Ukraine, would be counterproductive. That was also part of the story of the Marshall Plan, uh, that it was launched before the Federal Republic of Germany was created and essentially supervised and managed by local governments in Germany. And one of the things that it does is to build up local democracy. And local democracy is a really effective way of combating corruption. Um, the essence of the Marshall Plan was in the vision of a European context. Uh, Paul Hoffman spoke repeatedly 
about the need for a European political union. In that context, I think is still essential. The issue of closer engagement with the EU was after all the critical element in the precipitation of the Maidan. Um, and uh, that is really going to be the key to guiding the success of Europe and of Ukraine in the future, it lies in integration. Um, the difficulty, I think, is then, and that's the difficulty that Vlad was wrestling with in the previous presentation, can you entrust it to a well-level multilateral institution such as the IMF? Well, it's difficult as long as the geopolitical tensions remain. Um, and in general, the less politicized the administrating organization, the better you do. Uh, the IMF could have been a powerful part of the Marshall Plan, uh, but it was ruled out because the US State Department was worried at that time because of the controversy about the first uh, American executive director of the IMF, uh, the key figure in making the whole Bretton Woods system, Harry Dexter White. There was a controversy about whether he was a Soviet spy or not. And uh, the consequence of that controversy was that the IMF was pushed out of this, uh, this program. Um, but looking forward, and something that wasn't really mentioned in the first part, you need to look, I think, also beyond the G7. Um, uh, thinking about the global connections are crucial. Thinking about the role of China in solving the Ukraine crisis at the moment is also, I think, part of the challenge. Um, Ukraine is a key linkage in the Belt and Road that connects China to Europe. And there's a strong historical interest of China in Ukraine's development. And a governance structure that allows for the re-engagement of Ukraine thus needs an element of flexibility. The Marshall Plan was directed to global prosperity, and uh, uh, there's a strong case, I think, for building a general program for the management of post-conflict societies rather than a specifically Ukraine-oriented effort. You need to avoid the dark side of the Marshall Plan. You don't want a reconstruction project that's just seen as advancing the agenda of the US or of some EU countries or of the EU Commission. That would be absolutely fatal. You need to think of it in a global context. And I think also, unlike Germany in 1945 or after 1945, where there was a real question about whether Germans can be democratic or not, there is in this case no need to teach Ukraine or Ukrainians lessons about democracy and democratic values. And on the contrary, I believe that Ukraine has a great deal to teach the West in this respect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we seem to have Muted. lost. And no, I'm back. Okay. Sorry, that was my bookshelf. Forgive me. I was looking. I'm I'm working on another computer. Um, thank you, Professor James. That was a spectacularly not just comprehensive but, but truly riveting presentation, especially in the lessons part. Um, I wanted to bring you back with one question, um, and I would ask you for a brief answer, um, since we have three more presentations. But you, you noted in your third point, um, third lesson about debt relief, this gross debt position corresponds to very substantial, mostly privately held assets abroad. That I think was a tactful way of uh, mentioning the, olig the oligarch issue. Um, now that was not a problem that the Germans had after, or other countries had after 1945. Um, would you care to explain what you think the role of the oligarchs should be here? Do we, should they pay a patriotic tax? Um, I, I, I think uh, you know, efforts to get them to pay a patriotic tax would be, be great, uh, but it would also be great if they got involved in the reconstruction. So I think the, the story of trying to sketch out a long-term horizon where uh, Ukraine is a vibrant, dynamic economy that doesn't just depend on 
raw material or energy uh, issues and raw material exports have been really at the core of what Ukraine has done since the 1990s, um, food exports. Um, you, you really need a transition uh, to a different kind of economy. And, you know, I think that is a challenge uh, that you could say is also a challenge uh, for a post-conflict Russian society as well, uh, that uh, as long as you have these these raw material-based economies, they're likely to produce the kinds of oligarch story. And, uh, you know, oligarchs need to be invested in the future. You need to think of ways of doing that and uh, of making that institutionally possible. A tax is one way, but not just tax. Cool. Sorry, that was a slightly facetious way of putting it, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad you pinpointed that issue. I'm very grateful um, for, for that explanation, and I will now um, lead over to Brian De Silva. Brian De Silva has just retired from US government service after 32 years. He's been involved in Sudan and South Sudan since 1981 as an academic, a USAID senior policy advisor, and most recently as an advisor to Prime Minister Hanok till, until the coup of 2021. Over to you, Brian De Silva. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'll try to um, stick to a few points. Uh, just in reflection, U.S. government interest in Sudan and South Sudan have existed across all U.S. administrations, Democratic and Republican, over the last 40 years. Some of the reasons have been political, others have been humanitarian as well as security related. I'll just uh, share some highlights uh, of these, including the following. This is not an exhaustive list. Under Presidents Carter, Reagan, and George H.W. Bush, Bush in the 1980s, Sudan became the largest recipient of development assistance in Sub-Saharan Africa. In addition, it, re it received military and humanitarian assistance as a result of the Camp David peace accords and the famine of 84-85. The second civil war between the government of Sudan and rebels of the SPLMA, led by U.S. PhD economist, I should say U.S. trained PhD economist John Garang, started in May 83. The coup of Bashir on June 30th, 1989, led to a halt of all development and military assistance by the end of February 1990, according to U.S. law. Now we shift to the 1990s, where under President Clinton, U.S. sent its ambassador from Khartoum to visit the SPLM slash A rebel held areas in South Sudan in February of 1993. A key reason was to respond to the humanitarian disaster called the Hunger Triangle, a fallout from the 1991 split of the SPLMA leadership. In addition, the U.S. tried to reconcile the split between Garang and other SPLM factions led by Riyak Machar. Due to congressional interest and pressure, Clinton's NSC imposed sanctions on Sudan and at the same time authorized use of development assistance to opposition-held areas of Sudan, mostly in South Sudan, which started in 1998-99. Congress authorized and appropriated assistance initially at a modest level of $5 million for the first year. Under President George W. Bush, the administration took a strong interest in Sudan and especially on a peace process between the government of Sudan and the SPLMA. President Bush appointed U.S. Administrator Andrew Natsios as Special Humanitarian Coordinator for Sudan in May 2001 and Senator John, John Danforth as the President's Special Envoy for Sudan in September 2001. The latter was just after 9-11. The peace process also brought USAID into negotiations between the US, between the GOS, the government of Sudan, and the SPLMA. It also brought together an interagency process within the US government and very close collaboration with the Congress. Andrew Natsios initiated new programs for the SPLMA areas in South Sudan under the objective of preparing South Sudan for peace. And these programs were initiated in what I would call rebel held areas. Programs were in agriculture revitalization, 22.5 million 
over five years, basic education, which was 20 million over five years, peace building, 20 million over five years. These were started in 2001, 2002. It's noteworthy that these programs were started through development assistance and not through humanitarian assistance. All of these were, were initiated even before a peace agreement had been negotiated. Under George W. Bush, supports the peace process continued till the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was negotiated and signed in January 2005 in Nairobi. The peace process also brought, brought close strategic coordination between the Troika, which is the US, UK, and Norway. This was also key to supporting peace implementation between 2005 and 2011. Close relations were built up during the CPA negotiations between the US and the SPLM leader Garang during the 2001-2005 period. However, Garang had an untimely death on June, July 30th, 2005. The US continued to develop relations with Garang's successor, President Salva Kiir. President Bush invited Salva Kiir four times for Oval Office visits between 2006 and January 2009. US-led donors in both political and economic support to implementation of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, as well as in development of human assistance between 2005 and 2011. Support from the US Congress was paramount during this period. It came from both sides of the aisle and both houses, which is the House and the Senate. The U.S. opened its consulate in Juba in November 2005. Now, into the levels of assistance, during the 2005-2011 time period, the U.S. provided over $3 billion in development assistance to South Sudan. It was still not yet an independent country. During the same time, the U.S. also provided a $1 billion in humanitarian assistance to South Sudan. Key areas of support during this time included governance, political and economic, agriculture, natural resource management, basic education, health and infrastructure. Between 2004 and 2006, the US provided nearly 200 million to open up over 2000 kilometers in South Sudan, as well as demining them. Subsequently in 2008, the first paved road in South Sudan was built by USAID between Juba and the border between Uganda for a cost of 250 million. Um, just in terms of comparison, uh, South Sudan was is a huge country and at independence in 2011, they had uh, paved roads, which are less than the state of Rhode Island. The other donors who also provided assistance were the UK, Norway, the European Union and the Netherlands. The UN had a UN mission to Sudan from 2005 to 2011 called UNMIS. And when South Sudan became independent, the UN had a mission, the UN mission to South Sudan from 2011 to the present. South Sudan became independent on July 9th, 2011, and the US upgraded its consulate to an embassy. However, it was not long before the euphoria of independence began to unwind and the country found itself in a downward spiral. Some key moments in this downward spiral, January 2012, barely six months after independence, South Sudan made a unilateral decision to stop oil production and exports by the government of South Sudan, probably the worst political and economic decision of the newly independent state. In July 2012, the president, Salva Kiir, summarily fired the entire cabinet, his first vice president and the secretary general of the SPLM, the ruling party, all in the same evening. In December 2013, the country descended into civil war in which it has been embroiled for the last nine years. All of the investment in governance structures, infrastructure, health and education were negated by the death and destruction caused by the civil war, which is started in 2013 to the present. In recent years, the US has provided nearly $1 billion a year in humanitarian, peacekeeping, 
and develop a sense of the dam. So the questions are, what have we learned? What has the US and the international community learned from all of our investment in time, financial and human resources in supporting South Sudan and the South Sudanese people in their quest for independence. This is from the ending of the war through the CPA to the current internal civil war in the newly independent country of South Sudan. Here are some of the lessons learned, uh, at least from my perspective. One is invest in institutions and don't tie success to one particular individual. In the case of South Sudan, the US very much tied assistance, uh, tied success to the leadership of Garang and his leadership of the SPLMA. The focus on governance should shift away from capital to states, that is to decentralize. From 2005 to 2011, investment of international partners was in Juba, the capital, as they wanted to be sure that if South Sudan became independent, they could run a state. Third, focus on root causes of conflict. In the case of South Sudan, we saw from the 1991 split in the SPLA, the importance of ethnic division and personal greed as it influenced political decision-making in the country. And I uh, contend that we did not do sufficient efforts to try to attack those causes of the conflict. The international community did not do enough to assist the South Sudanese dealing with these core issues. Fifth, the impact of trauma from experiencing long-term conflict. We had no idea as the magnitude of the issue only began to pay attention to this much later. Sixth, invest in infrastructure. The isolation of communities did not help in recovering from conflict. We needed to realize that a country like South Sudan with minimal roads and infrastructure needed linkages to facilitate conflict resolution and development. Focus on agriculture and need for a country like South Sudan with all its natural resources, it should be able to feed itself. There's no need for the billions of humanitarian assistance to feed over 50% of the population during the last nine years. During conflict, US and international should have been open to developing and nurturing youth and women leaders rather than supporting existing militaristic uh, structures and leaders. Insufficient attention to anti-corruption, the magnitude of corruption that has taken place, taken hold over the last 10 years is unbelievable. The international con community was well aware of it, who only paid lip service to anti-corruption and actual uh, efforts that were made. Oil revenues uh, never stopped since uh, oil was resumed in 2013, but there was hardly any accountability. Development partners were not strong enough to require accountability in publishing of oil revenues so that people knew how much money was received and where the money went. There was very little transparency. Transitions will take place. How, we, how do we prepare for it? And how do you support people in the country for the transition? be it political transition or a transition from war to peace. Too much attention is impaired on trying to justify the inflow of human resources with insufficient attention to accountability and transparency use of the country's own resources. South Sudan is a rich country, both in natural resources and human resources. Focus has to be on institutions and supporting a new generation of leaders who prioritize their own communities rather than getting rich at any cost. Some of the major points, you can have money, but you don't have diplomatic and political attention. You as a, a development partner will not have impact. We need to have a political conflict lens together with a technocratic lens. Political attention and policy are needed during the entire time in this case, for the life of a new country. Also, don't assume that dollars and political support will always be there in your favor. There is a need for a strong donor coordination system, especially with and within the UN system. This helps in the division of labor. Always remember that the strength of bilateral relations is between the people of the country and the people of the US. And I'd like to end with a short anecdote which came home to me in the aftermath of September 11. I was in South Sudan on a 
and flew out to Nairobi as the Twin Towers were falling. Exactly a year ago, on September 11, 2012, I happened to be in South Sudan in the town of Yambia. Um, unbeknownst to me, uh, the, the commissioner of Yambia was a lady called Mary Bieber had called for the entire town to get together for a memorial service at noon on September 11, 2002. And in that service, she said, we have to remember today the people who lost their lives in uh, the incidents of 9-11. And we also have to be with the people of the US because when we were bombed by Sudan, they were always with us. And today on 9-11, 2002, the people of South Sudan are with the people of the US. In all my briefings to senior US government and other people who go out to South Sudan, I said, you have a political um, role there and a political job, but cannot forget the fact that the relations are there between the people of South Sudan and the people of the US. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was uh, a riveting and, and rather moving um, account of your experiences in South Sudan. Um, it sounded um, as though it was searing for you personally as well, for which I have some sympathy, um, having spent some time in Africa as a, as a journalist myself. There is, and I think there are, in, in, your, in your extensive list of, of mistakes to avoid, I think there are a lot of lessons very clearly for, for, for the Western Ukraine. But it struck me that uh, there was one thing that you didn't mention in your presentation, and that is um, something that Harold James did mention, which is that Ukraine, for example, is uh, plays the role not just in Russia's strategic calculations, but also those of China. Was to, in your experience, there uh, an, a role for Russia and or China in South Sudan as well that complicated um, Western efforts at reconstruction and aid? Well, China has had a major role in Sudan because of its assistance in oil exploration and development. So from 1999 to 2011, the major oil fields that were explored uh, really started off with China and then with the support of India and Malaysia were a key factor in the exports of oil for Sudan. Between 2005 and 2011, on the peace agreement, oil revenues were shared for the first time between 2005 with Sudan and South Sudan. After 2011, when South Sudan became independent, they did not have any real time to develop their own sort of uh, uh, EPSAs, you might say, with the oil companies of China, Malaysia, and India. So, Everything was replicated. What had taken place in Sudan was replicated in South Sudan. So the same type of structures um, were shifted by China, India, and Malaysia from uh, Sudan to South Sudan. Now, in terms of uh, Russia's involvement, I would say Russia is more involved in Sudan than in South Sudan. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. That was a very helpful um, additional point. Um, and I will now move to a third speaker, Nahid Sarabi, who is a visiting uh, fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development and that is housed within the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. Uh, she's a development practitioner with over 10 years of experience and served as the Deputy Minister for Policy at the Afghan Ministry of Finance from 2017 to 2020, the highest ranking professional woman at the ministry in the pre-Taliban times. Nahid Sarabi, Sarabi, it's great to have you on this panel as someone who uh, also spent some time in Afghanistan. I am very eager to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Constanze. And it's such a great pleasure to be part of this panel with such interesting uh, discussion. Um, as you said, having come from Afghanistan and working there, I can um, very well understand the toll that war takes on reconstruction and development and overall economy. I want to begin by providing a political economy background that underpins most of the development efforts um, in their years of reconstruction in Afghanistan. The reconstruction efforts began when many development indicators were 
were at their lowest. The country had suffered over a decade from international isolation and civil war that depleted its infrastructure, institutions, and human capital. The political settlement of 2001 Bonn Conference brought into structure the elites and stakeholders of the previous decades that to a great extent shaped the nature and dynamics of institution building and development in the country. The main course of action was war and terror and reconstruction followed. So you had a country that was in the middle of the conflict that also pursued development and economic goals. While much of the international efforts was consumed by fighting terrorism, um, I just want to focus on economic development here and some of the lessons learned. Um, more than 70 donors and international agencies were involved in Afghanistan from 2001 till 2021 um, before the collapse of Afghanistan in the hands of Taliban, um, where some seven to five donors did the heavy lifting, um, while US and EU being one of the uh, top of five donors. I want to begin with the question, was there a strategy for reconstruction and development? And the question was, yes, Afghanistan developed four development strategies over the course of 20 years. The first one in 2002 put forward an ambitious but moderately prioritized plan for reconstruction and development. The Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund that was administered by the World Bank was established which even continued um, before the collapse and until now. It was then followed by a five-year Afghanistan National Development Strategy and Afghanistan National Peace and Development Frameworks one and two subsequently. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough convergence on implementing the first development framework within the donors in its national plans, which also led to too many projects led by international agencies and donors themselves. The subsequent strategies became ambitious plans that reflected these, but not the observative capacity of both the government and non-government actors. For example, the first national development strategy was costed around $50 billion, but only if you count the entire commitment and disbursement of donor funds doesn't go beyond $67 billion over the course of 20 years. Afghanistan witnessed tremendous improvement in some sectors. Human capital indicators, for example, and health and education had an upward trend during the first decade. This was also because these indicators are one of the worst. For example, girls' enrollments in school was zero uh, when the Taliban were toppled. Health service delivery, mostly through NGOs, was a great success. Community building and development remain consistent and also one of the success stories during the years of reconstruction and development. However, progress in other sectors remained mixed and sluggish compared to 20 years of international investment. Priorities in sectors and how to absorb donors' funds were not well identified. For example, despite high dependence of rural people on agriculture, which is 75%, the sector did not have many success stories. Community development and big infrastructure development did not go parallel. Despite um, years of investment, Afghanistan remained a highly aid dependent country with over 70% of its public expenditure still financed by aid before the Taliban takeover. Now, why this? First, not enough inconsistent investments were done in years that could generate revenues for the government to respond to the growing needs and become self-sufficient. Second, corruption and weak institutions caused leakages in the systems. And third, although most of parts of the security expenditure were externally financed, it still exerted pressure on civilian budget and enforced investment trade-offs for the government. I want to also draw a few um, analysis on the nature of development assistance. International assistance to Afghanistan suffered from short-termism and unpredictability, something which also came during um, the discussion on Ukraine. Um, for example, pledges from the international community were made and renewed every four years through cumbersome exercises of international conferences. 
that somehow influence government to make short-term development plans versus long ones and say yes to any type of aid that came through. There was also um, a degree of difference between aid pledged and aid dispersed. For example, the Afghanistan Republic um, data estimated more than 80 billion of dollars of pledges, while OECD data shows the total dispersed from 2002 to 2020 to be $67 billion. So there was a, like a degree of difference between aid pledged and committed and also dispersed. First decade of reconstruction and development saw high amounts of aid dispersed with its peak levels in 2010 and 2011. The Afghan Republic data in 2018 showed that out of total grants dispersed to Afghanistan, only 33% was spent on budget, meaning using country systems. Previous years showed even lower on budget spending rates. This modality of aid disbursement gave rise to weak government systems and parallel systems outside the government. As a result, alliances were drawn more to aid providers, undermining government legitimacy. On the other hand, high levels of aid financing made the government more accountable towards donors than the citizens and public. Aid coordination had both success stories and its challenges. With too many donors being involved in Afghanistan, prioritization became an onerous job. Donor priorities reflected that of their capitals, which became challenging back in Afghanistan to coordinate. However, despite obstacles, a lot of work and a lot of work needed from the government side, of course. There was a mechanism of donor coordination that was put in place in Afghanistan in form of a joint body co-chaired by United Nations and the Afghan government. It met on frequent basis and it provided a platform of accountability between the government and donor agencies and a platform of coordination for plans and priorities. Um, I want to close my statements just maybe if I could draw two big lessons from the construction and development efforts in the past 20 years, although there's a lot to cover. First of all, a strategy with prioritized plan and predict predictable resources is essential. Donors must stay vigilant of unpredictable security situation as it was in the case of Afghanistan. I would say less ambitious plans and as our motto was in the last years, um, in the Avon Republic, promise list deliverable. Second, country ownership and donor coordination and planning is of a sense. It is not only about ownership of the processes of taking conditionalities and um, agreeing to those conditionalities, but also taking ownership in terms of implementation. Corruption will be an issue. There will be uh, debates on country systems being improved, but the main aim of the aid should be to um, capitalize and improve those systems and not to make parallel structures. Um, I would stop it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nahid. Um, I'm conscious of the passage of time. I have questions, but I also don't want to uh, shortcut our, our third, uh, our fourth and final speaker, uh, Hideki Masunaga, who is uh, the Director General for the Middle East and Europe um, uh, Department in the Japanese International Cooperation Agency. And, and I want to note in this context that Brookings is grateful to have received previous funding from the agency, but uh, it is uh, in no way associated with uh, this event. We're always grateful when our donors respect our, our independence, and this has been the case here. Hideki Matsunaga, you will speak to us about the case of Iraq, which you've been associated with, but you are also currently um, overseeing uh, JICA efforts in relationship to Ukraine. So if you could link those two, I think we'd be grateful in the remaining time that we have. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this panel. I just actually returned from a trip to Ukraine uh, last Sunday. And uh, I'm currently, as you just said, engaged in the reconstruction. I mean, response to the Ukraine crisis. Uh, in the past, I was engaged in the re Iraq reconstruction for a number of years. Uh, I understand because of these experiences, 
Today, I'm asked to talk about the comparison of the reconstruction of Ukraine and Iraq. But uh, when we try to compare uh, the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine with the cases of fragile country, such as South Sudan, Afghanistan, or Iraq, there is often strong opposition. Ukraine is not the country like Iraq or Afghanistan or South Sudan. Yes, it is true. There are also fundamental differences between Ukraine now and most of the country rebuilding after the Second World War. However, what we should mainly learn from these cases, not so much about the country's context, but about the mistakes and failures of the international community and donors. Thus, we can and must learn from past efforts and restructuring while also recognizing the uniqueness of Ukrainian situation. Uh, let me frame my comments around four uh, set of issues. First, ownership. Now he touched upon this, you know, in the uh, closing part. I think all of the experience indicate that to be successful, reconstruction has to be owned by the country itself. The reconstruction has to be embedded in its own vision for the future. Action taken by the international community need to reinforce national success through national institution. This has arguably not been in the case in some instances, especially in Iraq, where the international community has perhaps been too much in the driver's seat. Inextricably linked to this is what we mean by the country. We aren't just talking about the government or a political and economic elite, but about the people themselves. This was not the case in previous reconstruction effort, but Ukraine is potentially going to be different because of the circumstances and the fact that the government and civil society are already laying out their vision of what reconstruction should do and how it should be managed. Another unique feature of Ukraine is that it has succeeded in de decentralization to uh, some extent before the you know, Russian aggression through delegating authority to local governments. There is significant potential that geographic regions or blast or municipality will take part in and benefit from the reconstruction. Second, the cost of the reconstruction, this was being discussed by Vlad and Yuri at the first panel. Who will pay and how to bear the cost of reconstruction of Ukraine? At the Lugan conference, the Ukrainian government estimated the cost of reconstruction up to 2032 is approximately $750 billion. Uh, US dollars, while the short term needs are around 100 billion US dollars. Because of the worsening attack on infrastructure after October 10th, the figure could be higher. In the case of Iraq, it was estimated that uh, about 220 billion US dollars was spent on reconstruction between 2003 to 2012, 66% of which was financed by its own oil revenue. In the case of Ukraine, we cannot expect uh, much revenue from natural resources. And each donor country's fiscal situation is worse than when the Iraq war started. Already in response to the crisis in Ukraine, several donors has pledged and dispersed a substantial amount of assistance, but there might be less money available for the reconstruction of Iraq in the future and in the end. The Ukrainian government will probably fund out of its budget, but it does have limitation. Uh, were repatriation or seized asset of Russia could be a source, but as we know, there are mainly many political and legal difficulties. We have to find ways to fund the cost. Third, and linked to this you know, cost issue is private sector participation. Substantial money to rebuild infrastructure may come from donors or from the Ukrainian government budget, but the resources required for physical infrastructure development are so great 
the private as well as the public finance is essential. The private sector will invest if there are opportunities and if the investment can, me, can be made less risky and generate a return. It is not so easy as we speak. You know? So a major task for the international community is to de-risk de private investment. Another reason private sector participation is important that it is essential to create job opportunities. Most of the reconstruction efforts since the Marshall Plan have not generated the employment that allowed ordinary people to benefit and to rebuild their lives. In Iraq, the most critical shortcoming was the reconstruction failed to diversify the Iraqi economy away from the dominant oil sector. As a result, few economic opportunities were created in the non-oil private sector. Fourth is the issue of collaboration and coordination of different stakeholders. Many previous panel, you know, discuss about this, but coordination, uh, you know, collaboration, both domestic and international. The domestic coordination, of course, will be a challenge, but I would like to emphasize that the international community is not particularly good at collaborating either. Vlad touch upon about this. The idea of coordinating entity has a merit, but requires careful thought to ensure that it remains at the service of Ukrainian reconstruction rather than dominates it. And that Ukrainian ownership of the process is not undermined. In Iraq, reconstruction became a set of disparate project rather than a national enterprise, in part because each donor oversaw project for which it was providing funding. In part, this is because sovereign state or international institution governed by sovereign states have processes and procedure that have to be followed and have to make the case that what they are doing use, uses public money well. The World Bank 2011 World Development Report argued that donors and the international organization are accountable first to their constituencies and shareholders and only second to the people of recipient states. It calls this the dual accountability dilemma. In Iraq, the good intention of the Iraqi and the many you know, international staff in the field often went unheeded by official back in donor capitals. Um, I think you know, Ukraine uh, can learn from the lesson of past reconstruction effort, but it is equally if not more important that the countries and international institutions that want to support it also learn from them. Let me stop here. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, David, Am I? do I understand correctly that we have a hard stop in three minutes? We did. So you can ask one question as long as um, Hideki's answer is two and a half minutes. Yes, uh, okay, H Hideki. Um, you, I think, gave a very uh, thorough account of, of the really very substantial technocratic challenges to, um, to the reconstruction of Ukraine. Um, and, I, and I assume that you may not be particularly willing to answer the question that I'm going to ask you, but what about the political questions, uh, the political challenges to reconstruction, both in Iraq and in Ukraine? Um, and by that, I mean Western cohesion, and I mean you, uh, involvement of authoritarian great powers. Right, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, I, I think, you know, it's a big, big questions and, uh, you know, political issues. Uh, I think it's both applied to international politics as well as the domestic politics. So we have to look at the both ways, you know, Western powers, and it's not the one voice, Within the Western powers, there are a little bit of pushback and, uh, you know, uh, maybe small fighting. And also, there is a political, you know, relationship between the West and Russia, and could be a China as well. So we really need need to look at that international context. At the same time, we should look into their, um, you know, domestic politics as well. So. Uh, 
you know, I mean, Ukraine has gone through many cycle of revolution and changes in the past, like 20 years ago, 15 years ago change. There was a, a revolutionary, you know, people as well as old guard. So we really need to look at that. But, the, you know, my visit, I, I'm quite encouraged those young leaders, you know, very dynamic and thanks a lot. Thank you so much um, for staying within our time limits. I just want to say, I thought this was a riveting set of two panels um, on the challenge presented by Ukraine. Um, a global war, uh, sorry, a regional war with already global implications and no clear end in sight. We've heard particularly in the second panel, which I had the honor to moderate, a lot of cautionary tales from which we must learn. But we also, I think, understand that this war more than perhaps some of the others discussed here um, may have repercussions on our own future and our own future prosperity, safety, and security. And with that, I thank you all for participating. Um, it's been an honor and a pleasure to listen to you, to moderate you. We could have gone on for hours. And I'm particularly grateful to David Wessel for working with uh, the Foreign Poli Policy Division and my center on the US on Europe for this. Thank you everyone um, and have a good day. I hope to see you all again in similar contexts. Goodbye. So thank you so much. That was really great fun. No, oh, good. Yes, thank you. It was, uh, I think there's a lot of content there.